Welcome back to Mikasa. Mikasa is Sukasa. Over there is my bed frame. So let me do a little bit of this. Good as new. We're in the studio. Nobody knows any differently today. We're talking about some sleepers in Dynasty. Listen, there's no such thing as a sleeper in Dynasty. Everybody knows everything about everyone. If you play Dynasty, you know like 280 players in the NFL. You know more players than Sean McVay can name off the top of his head, which is impressive and also sad because you get paid to crunch numbers, yet in your free time you know who the fourth string running back on the fucking Chargers is. Shout out Larry Roundtree. Let's get straight into the video and stop rambling. All right, welcome back from the intro. I'm looking like Ralph Macchio's younger sister. First player we're going to talk about today, we got four names, count them four, Lord Farquaad style, is Alexander Madison, currently the running back of the Minnesota Vikings, but he's on this list because he could be on the move. Out of Boise State, people slandered the poor guy coming into the league, and right now I see him as a value despite everything that's went on in his career, despite having to sit behind Dalvin Cook despite having to take over the throne as the backup running back that was formerly Jarek McKinnon to Matt Asiata. The Vikings have had such a weird running back stable since my existence has begun. Regardless, we, I, don't know why I'm, I don't know why I'm holding the mic like this. We have Alexander Madison. He's currently being valued as the running back 38, and there's a multitude of reasons as to why I think this makes him a value. Number one, Tony Pollard is the RB30 in Dynasty, and sure, Zeke is more cooked than Dalvin, but, that's a sick-ass pun, but I think Alexander Madison might have a more realistic path to relevance in the near future than Tony Pollard does, and when Alexander Madison is on the field, that man is incredible. We saw this year what happened when Dalvin Cook got injured. There were four games, again, where Dalvin Cook did not play. In those games, Alexander Madison was incredible. He averaged 18 and a half fantasy points a game. His reception numbers were great, 3, 3, 6, and 7. He had 100 total yards in all but one game, but he scored in all of them. He was the RB... Give me one second, let me check this out. He was the RB 7, 8, 6, and 13 in those games. So when Dalvin Cook is out, he produces as an RB 1 in fantasy. And for the price that you can get him for, and with Dalvin Cook's injury history... And with the fact that Minnesota has an out on Dalvin Cook's contract after this year and Alexander Madison is an unrestricted free agent after la after this upcoming season, it tells me that one, Madison probably has value this year because Dalvin Cook can't stay healthy. Two, he's going to have value next year by way of either Dalvin Cook leaving and him staying or Madison testing the market and becoming a starting running back elsewhere. I'm not necessarily sure he has what it takes to be an elite starting running back for a 17 game season. Nobody can confidently say that because we haven't seen that out of Alexander Madison. All I know is the guy is really good when he has the ball in his hands. He's really good when given the opportunity. And he still faced top 10 in terms of stacked box rate, the average number of defenders in the box. So it's not like he was just running crazy against four, five, six man boxes. He was averaging upwards of 6.8 men in the box. That's a whole Bukaki scene. Every time he touched the ball, and despite this, he was still extremely productive. I think for that RB38 price tag, you can probably buy him for a round three rookie pick, which considering how bad this rookie class is at the top end for running backs, the equivalent running back you're going to get in the third round is going to be garbage. Maybe, just maybe the receiver that you pick in the third round ends up being an Amonra St. Brown, but that's like a one in 12 chance. And I'm no mathematician, but that's less than 10%. I really like what Alexander Madison brings to the table. I like his future prospects, and I really like his age as well. I think every video there's been a point where I could bring up an R. Kelly joke, but I'm not doing that. He is extremely young. There are only three running backs currently in the top 12 consensus ranks or the top 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 in the top 12 for ADP amongst running backs that are younger than him. It is Jonathan Taylor. It is cam Akers and it is jk dobbins he's younger than guys like Najee harris and elijah mitchell and we've seen him produce when he is on the field so 
even if next year is the first year where he finally breaks out and gets his start and by next year i mean 2023 not the 2022 season he's still gonna be like 24 25 years old with not too many or not too much tread taken off of his tires so really like alexander madison really like what he's shown to this point and i like the future prospects of his career if that makes sense i like his potential and i like the fact that you can get him as a pseudo throw into a deal like you're gonna probably have to pay a fourth rounder in addition to him being thrown into the deal or a third round pick swap straight up for alexander madison which i would do nine times out of ten the next man i want to talk about is bill belichick's love child the one that got away miami's very own braxton barrios wide receiver currently on the jets played for the jets this past season is an unrestricted free agent being valued as the wide receiver 73 in dynasty i told you when i went for sleepers i'm going real deep pause i i went for guys who are like running back 30 plus when you're a running back 30 plus nobody wants you when you're past wide receiver 50 you really don't have an adp it just depends on who likes you in the league and where they're going to pick you so he along with the next guy i'm going to talk about are beyond the wide receiver 70 threshold when it comes to adp meaning you can probably get this guy round 15 plus the reason why i like braxton barrios isn't because i think he is going to eventually become a wide receiver one or a wide receiver two hell wide receiver three is probably lofty I'm buying into Braxton Barrios because with the way that the league is going, it's very hard to come by wide receivers who have as versatile of a skill set as a guy like Debo Samuel or what we saw out of Amon Ross St. Brown this year or what Corderell Patterson put on display or what any of these guys that Kyle Shanahan picks in the second round, whatever they go out and do, not many people have that in their bag. And I am not comparing Braxton Barrios to any of these men. All I'm saying is from the flashes that he showed this past season, I think he's going to have a bigger command in this year's free agent class than a lot of people are expecting. He's not an elite receiver, but he's a very, very, very good return man. He made the Pro Bowl because of that. He showed versatility being able to run out of the slot, but also being used out of the backfield. And I think him being a special teams contributor is going to help him find a spot on a new team, get some pretty decent money. And the fact that he got cut from the Patriots or he didn't make the Patriots, he went to the Jets and he worked his way up the depth chart shows me that one, the guy's improved and two, the guy, along with his versatility, works hard. For as lame as that is and as for, for as stereotypical as it would be for me to call a, a scrappy white wide receiver who runs out of the slot, surprisingly, to be a hard worker, listen, all the stars are aligning, but I really believe it. I believe I was talking about how white Braxton Berrios is. If that's the case, let me just pick up where I left off. Yeah, I, I it's hard for me to believe that a guy who worked his way from the bottom up and showed the versatility that he did and had the trust in the coaching staff, although it was the Jets coaching staff, which really doesn't say much, although he gained that trust on a new team starting from a role that started at zero to doing what he did, having a four-week span where people were winning millions of dollars on all these DFS sites playing him at min prices, scoring four touchdowns in a four-week span, one through the air, one in the kick return game, two on the ground, shows me that the guy is talented, he is versatile, he is elusive, and he is what a lot of coaches want on the field, a guy who will contribute on special teams but also be a force to be reckoned with on the offensive side of the ball. Again, he's not going to be a league winner, although he was kind of like that this year. He's not going to be somebody who slots into your starting lineup every week, but he's a sleeper in the sense that you can get him for – basically free can throw him into the end of a deal if you feel like you're being slightly if you feel like you're losing slightly on a deal and you want just that extra smidgen of value throw him braxton barrios on that side of it and i'm sure you'll be a little bit happier knowing that you have a potential flex option going forward next up is kendrick Bourne, wide receiver 78 this is per dlf adp so i don't know how legitimate this is this is what i used all the time last year so i assume it's got to be some somewhat legitimate not a farce i don't understand this wide receiver 78 for a guy who's only 26 years old who in his first year on a new team put up wide receiver 31 numbers again wide receiver 31 isn't anything to write home about it is not a league winner but it's somebody who you could slot into your starting lineup or in your flex position or in dynasty when you have 45 guys in your roster and you're scraping the bottom of the barrel 
and you're starting three flex options, he's an every week starter for you. And despite playing with a rookie quarterback in a new situation and putting up those new numbers and people not being far-sighted enough to see that he has the potential to improve, he's being valued amongst absolute frauds. One fraud around his value is Braxton Barris, who we just talked about. But listen, a guy who finishes as high as he did, despite not being involved in valuable aspects of the game for fantasy purposes, right? He was 75th, I believe, in red zone targets and 78th in deep targets. Either one flip flop them. Either way, he was outside the top 70 in both of those. So the chunk yardage that he was picking up was all on his own. The red zone usage wasn't there. So the touchdowns were all by way of his yards after the catch ability and catching passes from outside the 20 yard line. He just looks like an extremely talented and efficient wide receiver. And we can see that by way of efficiency numbers. He was number two in fantasy points per target, number two in quarterback rating when targeted, and number two in yards per target. Obviously, it's not going to be linear. The guy is not going to go from 80 targets to 100 targets and keep the same yards per target. If that was the case, then you would just tell Bill Belichick to throw in the ball 200 times every season and he'd go for like 5,000 yards and make Cooper Cup look like he's never eaten breakfast with Matthew Stafford before. I get that it's not going to be linear, but this is the same case that we made for Juju Smith-Schuster after his rookie year when he was extremely efficient and we said, hey, give him a few more targets and the guy's probably going to be good. In his second year in the league, that's exactly what happened. He was pretty good. Same argument was made for Stefan Diggs back in Minnesota. He had that one year where he got no targets and he was efficient and we said, feed him some more targets. Or when he went to Buffalo, we said, feed him more targets and the guy's going to be good. What happened in Buffalo? He was really fucking good. A.J. Brown, same thing. Debo Samuel, same thing. These guys who are extremely efficient and have shown the ability to win after the catch, when given more opportunity, they're going to produce and outproduce what they have done in the past. He was a wide receiver 31, as I mentioned. And if we look at what the wide receiver landscape and what the wide receiver room looks like in New England right now, sure, Jacoby Myers was their wide receiver one last year because he led the team in targets. But he had like 55 more targets, only 66 more yards. That is ridiculous. That needs to change. And although a kid in a fucking headband and a flannel on YouTube is saying it needs to change, that's not going to do anything. But I think his play on the field and him building a little more chemistry with Mac Jones going into year two, both of them going into year two in that situation, getting a little more comfortable with each other, I think is going to help things shake out and change up for the better. He's a versatile guy. We saw him in San Francisco in years past be used in the red zone game and score red zone touchdowns. So I don't think that he just became physically incapable of scoring touchdowns down by the sticks. If that becomes a bigger part of his game and Hunter Henry's and catching 15 touchdowns on seven targets somehow, if his touchdown numbers come up, if his overall volume comes up, I don't see a way where he doesn't outproduce wide receiver 78 value. That's a very low bar to clear, but I don't see a way that he doesn't present top 36 upside at least for next season. And if he puts up numbers like that, he's a free agent going into 2023. He's not going to be all that old, 27, 28 years old. He's going to command a market in that upcoming free agent class. And he just looks like a guy to me who has a very high ceiling in terms of dynasty value, especially because where it's set at right now his value is extremely low so he's somebody i'm buying in on he's somebody that i'm confident in just like braxton barry was throwing into the end of a deal i'd flip a third round pick for him easily i'd even probably throw a back end second for him but i do think as the draft approaches you can probably get him for a mid a middling to maybe early third round pick so i wouldn't send out an offer like that just yet and last up i'll talk about a tight end because tight ends get absolutely no love around these parts we got dan arnold he is the tight end 44 so i'm starting to question what the hell is happening in these dlf drafts but regardless he's the tight end 44 per dlf adp and that makes very little sense to me sure he hasn't done anything in the nfl or hadn't done anything in the nfl prior to this past season but what he did despite changing teams mid-year going from a I guess not a decent organization in Carolina, but going from there to probably and most likely the worst spot in the NFL in 2021, the Jacksonville Jaguars, it can't be overlooked. First off, he's an athletic freak. Ike, let's throw up his player profile right here, Dragon Ball Z action. He's an athletic freak. He's a little bit on the older side, but there was always that narrative that Titans take a while to break out anyways, and I'm pretty sure he's younger than Darren Waller was when Darren Waller first broke out, although he doesn't have the off-field issues that 
caused him to break out later. Regardless, he's a little, he's a little bit of an older dude when we're talking about sleepers and guys I want to buy in on for the rest of their careers in Dynasty. But he showed that he can be productive and he showed that he can be not the most efficient, but a pretty good top option on a receiving in a receiving core. And listen, he didn't score many touchdowns. I don't think he scored any at all. There was that one span when he moved to Jacksonville the second week on because his first week he ran nine routes, so he wasn't really too involved. And from then through when he got injured, he ran at least 22 routes every one of those games. And his pace over that span, I think, was 85 catches, 900-something yards, zero touchdowns. So although he was a tight end one, or I'll call him a fringe tight end one because he finished tight end 13 one of those weeks, he did that 66% of the time in four to six of those games in that span. He didn't score a touchdown. Leads me to believe that if this offense gets any better next year, which Trevor Lawrence in year two, I have no doubts that he's going to be better than what he was in year one because he fucking stunk. Urban Meyer's gone, so it's going to be better than that. Although Urban Meyer does like his tight ends on and off the field, so I'm not sure what's going to happen in that area of the fields. But I do think that the sky is the limit for him. By the sky, I mean like the tight end seven. But if he starts to score touchdowns, that pace... 85 for like 900 yards even if you add three four touchdowns to that that's a top five top six tight end obviously 85 receptions 900 yards isn't going to come to fruition if lavisca chenault gets used a little bit more if dj chark didn't get injured if travis Etienne was there soaking up some targets but a guy with his athletic profile a guy who you know they sunk some pretty good capital or like asset value into him in that trade they traded a former first round pick in cj henderson away for him Albeit, again, that front office is fucking... I can't say that word. They're very dumb. So, that might not be any sort of indictment on Dan Arnold's talent. But it goes to show that the team, at least... is probably too stupid to realize what a sunk cost fallacy is. I'm rambling. Regardless, they sunk a lot of value into him. He showed to be productive when he was on the team. And he did so despite not having a big role in Arizona, not having a big role in Carolina, then going to a brand new team. And after one week, stepping into a massive role, I think, although he got injured towards the end of the year, a full off season with this team, with this new coaching staff and with them seeing how athletic of a, and with them seeing how big of a freak athlete he is, shout out animal. Uh, I do believe that he is going to leverage his talents into fantasy viability still 26 years old free agent after this year so if he does end up producing he's gonna be able to test the market and his value only stands to rise again tight end 44 this is like a no lose situation for me because the only way he drops in dynasty value is if some pretty significant things happen off the field and he's not allowed to play in the nfl again so that's not to say i don't think he can reach top 12 dynasty value uh, at the position but i do think that it's a pretty safe bet for you to add him to the end of a deal, as I said, with the other two guys, or trade a late third round rookie pick for him if that's he's if that's how he's being valued in your league. But that'll do it for today. I wanted to keep it a little a little bit shorter than I had in previous videos. It's only four players. I want to stay around like four or five minutes apiece. I plan on doing the same thing next week, but maybe I'll switch it up depending on your guys' feedback. Thanks for watching. Hopefully my ramblings gave you a little bit of value. Hopefully you enjoy the headband that came back this week. Maybe I'll rock it again next week if you guys like. But that's it. Hope you guys enjoyed. See you next week. Peace.